military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. If you're tuning in for the first time in a while, you may want to stop and go back a few episodes because this is part three in my series on a serial killer commonly known as the scorecard killer, Randy Kraft. You really need to listen to episodes one and two first before diving in here. For those of you sticking around today, same warnings as last time. This is the most gruesome murderer I have covered to date. Also, he has the highest body count and he was known for cruel and unusual torture. This episode contains dark true crime, so listener beware. Complaining after you've listened to the warning and you still choose to listen will not be tolerated. So please do not complain if you're disturbed later. You are an adult. With that warning out of the way, join me today as I bring you the conclusion of the scorecard killer. Now let's dig in. Shout out to my girl Sloan from Killer Queens for researching and writing this episode. Sources for this episode include articles found in the Orange Coast, LA Times, Murderpedia, randycraft.com, patch.com, and an opinion by the California Supreme Court. When I left off in part two, two of Randy's last known victims were discovered in February of 83, and he had just been arrested in May of 83. After the police arrested Randy Kraft, his car was searched, and so was his home. The car turned up 47 pictures of men in various states of undress, in various stages of life, Some were still alive, but others were already dead when the pictures were taken. There was also the list of 61 coded names printed in neat handwriting in all capital letters, 30 entries on the left side and 31 on the right side of a sheet of yellow legal paper. Four of these entries indicated double murders with Terry Gambrell and Eric Church. That brought Randy's possible total victim count to 67. 22 of the victims on this scorecard, as this yellow legal page was later known, they were either never found or never identified. They have John Doe's that have been linked to Randy, but the detectives haven't been able to give them an identity and Randy has never spoken. This list is what led Randy Kraft to be known, as I mentioned earlier, as the scorecard killer. While the entries were puzzling at first, the detectives and other officials involved in the case, they were able to unlock some of the coded entries. It was eventually determined that the names of Eric Church and Terry Gambrell had not been added to the list. Randy probably hadn't had time to add Terry Gambrell yet because remember, he was literally in the car with him when he was stopped and arrested. Detectives figured out that the entries were less random than originally thought. Entries like EDM were easy enough to link to a victim because it was their initials. For example, EDM stood for Edward Daniel Moore. But other entries like OIL, oil, and angel were more cryptic and thus more difficult to decode. In all, investigators were able to decode and connect 42 victims to entries on this so-called scorecard. The officers went to Randy's home and they executed a search warrant. In that search, they found the pictures of three men that had been found dead, but their murders remain unsolved. The pictures of Robert Loggins, Roger Duvall, and Jeffrey Nelson were of the men after they had already died. Fibers from a rug in Randy Kraft's garage would end up matching fibers found on the body of 18-year-old Scott Hughes, that was found on the Riverside Freeway back in April of 78. Additionally, two personal items belonging to a John Doe in Grand Rapids, Michigan, were also found in Randy's house. 
Randy's bail was set at $250,000, but he never posted bail. It's unclear if he had the money and chose not to post or what. While in jail, Randy wrote to his sister, and one such letter would reveal what a real psychopath Randy really was. He wrote to his sister, quote, I was just thinking that I could look at this as being away at some sort of school, you know, taking some classes I never signed up for, end quote. <laughs> About four-ish or so months after his arrest in September of 83, Randy was charged with the murders of 16, that's one six, men, as well as 11 counts of sodomy, nine counts of sexual mutilation, and three counts of robbery. Randy was able to be charged with the murders of the following 16 men. Now, I'm going to state their names and their code names, which police were able to tie directly to that victim. The first one was 19-year-old Keith Davin Crotwell, and his code name was Parking Lot. His case ended up being a 1975 murder. There was 20-year-old Donnie Harold Crissell, and his code name was Marine Drunk Overnight Shorts. His murder occurred in 1979. Then there was Scott Michael Hughes. His code name was Euclid. He was another Marine killed in 77. Then there was 21-year-old Michael Joseph Inderbyton. His code name was Dart 405. His murder occurred in 78. Then there was 20-year-old Richard Allen Keith. His code name was Marine Carson. His murder also occurred in 78. There was 20-year-old Edward Daniel Moore. His code name, EDM and his murder occurred in 72. 20-year-old Ronnie Jean Weeb, his code name was 7th Street. He was murdered in 73. 23-year-old Roland Gerald Young, his code name was Jail Out, and his murder occurred in 77. 22-year-old Mark Howard Hall, his code word was New Year's Eve, and his murder occurred in 75. Then there was 18-year-old Jeffrey Allen Nelson and 20-year-old Roger James Duval Jr. And their code names were Two in One Beach. Their murder occurred just a few months before Randy was arrested in 83. Then there was 19-year-old Robert Wyatt Loggins. His code word was M-C-H-B Tattoo. His murder occurred in 80. Then there was 23-year-old Keith Arthur Klingenbeel. His code word was hike out LB boots. His murder occurred in 78. Then there was a 1973 John Doe who could either fall under the code name Hearth Off Head or Airplane Hill. And then there was 25-year-old Terry Lee Gambrell, which occurred in 83 and 21-year-old Eric Herbert Church, whose murder occurred also in 83. These last two did not have code words in that scorecard. These were the 16 men for which Randy Crafts was charged with murder. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, so you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up. No more shady business. 
Rituals Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. In January of 1984, the prosecution filed a written notice that they intended to attempt to prove 21 additional murders that had been discovered over 12 years and throughout three states. There were also questions about whether or not Randy had an accomplice in his murders. Forensic evidence in two of the murders suggested that another person had been there with Randy. In the case of John Williams Lara's, there were noted to have been two sets of footprints from where Lara's body was dragged to the water where he was found. Then in a different case, there was semen that wasn't a match to Randy. It was also thought that Randy would have difficulty moving, I don't know, like a body, 200 pounds of literal dead weight. Not to mention the difficulty level of driving full speed on a highway, opening the passenger door, pushing a body out, and then closing the door by himself. The police considered that maybe Randy's former lover, Jeff Graves, had participated in at least a few of the murders. However, by the time of the trial, Jeff Graves had died of AIDS before the police could question him. One of the investigators said that a man named Bob Jackson actually confessed to him that he had helped Randy murder a hitchhiker in Wyoming in 75, as well as one in Colorado in 76. Now, this Jackson guy, he also claimed that the names listed on Randy's scorecard were just the most memorable of his victims, but it was not an extensive list. Jackson claimed the real number of Randy's victims to be closer to 100, but this was never substantiated. Not to mention, when the investigators turned over the recordings of Jackson's alleged accomplice confession, they brought Jackson in and, after extensive questioning, convinced him to voluntarily commit himself to a mental health institution. Murder charges were never brought against Bob Jackson. And without concrete evidence of an accomplice, this theory was never brought to trial. During the trial, the prosecution would present the reasons that Randy was the only one responsible for each murder. And the defense would present alibis in order to attempt to prove that Randy was accounted for during the times he was supposedly torturing and dumping bodies, but none of the alibis really covered the right time frames. Randy's trial would be dubbed, quote, the longest, costliest murder case in Orange County, end quote. The preliminary hearing took place on September 27, 1983, after being pushed off with five postponements and then the hearing lasted seven weeks. Judge John Ryan ruled that no cameras were allowed in the courtroom during this preliminary hearing, but the public was allowed to be in the courtroom. Throughout the hearing, the highway patrol officers who arrested Randy, well, they testified to the events of that day, and every homicide that they could link to Randy was described in graphic detail. Forensic pathologists Walter Fisher and Robert Richards, they testified to the injuries sustained by each and every victim. Prosecutor Brian Brown called Randy, quote, a true scorecard killer, end quote. But Randy Kraft's attorney, Doug Otto, he just disregarded the prosecution, stating that they never proved anything against Randy, claiming they didn't even have enough evidence to go forward to trial. But Judge Ryan determined that there was sufficient evidence to hold Randy for trial. And in a surprising twist, Randy's attorney would later withdraw from the case because Randy Kraft, the narcissist, had been insistent about being co-counsel. Can you imagine? Uh, No, thanks. Despite having his attorney replaced quite quickly, delay after delay after delay, it ended up costing the taxpayers over $2 million by April of 84. That's before the trial even began. And while eight other murder charges were being filed against Randy, none of those eight charges would make it to trial. In 1988, Randy Kraft pled not guilty. His trial began on September 26, 1988, five years after his arrest. This time, the judge was Judge Daniel McCartan, 
and Randy's new attorney was C. Thomas McDonald. The defense filed various motions to have the searches performed on, I don't know, Randy's place in his car. They wanted those searches thrown out, but they were all denied. Judge McCartan did rule that only the named victims could be mentioned in court. No other alleged Randy Kraft victim could be mentioned throughout the trial. During the defense's opening statement, the defense called the state's case suspicious, innuendo, and prosecutorial rhetoric, and instead referred to Randy as a, quote, homeowner, taxpayer, and hard worker, just like many other citizens of our country, end quote. He confidently proclaimed that Randy Kraft was innocent. He hadn't killed anyone. The prosecution wound up calling more than 157 witnesses and presented over 1,000 exhibits that all suggested that the defense's proclamation of innocence was laughable. The state rested their case on November 30th of 88, and the defense began their, well, defense. They presented what they believed were alibis that could prove that Randy was not the murderer. One of their alibis was the presentation of the other two known serial killers who were active at the same time. And I mentioned them briefly, right? It was William Bonin and Patrick Kearney. After it was all said and done, it was all over on May 1st, 1989. Included in the prosecution's presentation of evidence were the photos and possessions that Randy Kraft had in his house and car tying him directly to the deceased men. The photographs that were found had both Roger Duvall and Robert Loggins in them. And in their pictures, the two men were evidently already dead. Another picture had clothes that were determined to be consistent with the clothes Eric Church was wearing when he disappeared. The prosecution would assert that Loggins was the name MCHB tattoo on Randy Kraft's list because he was in the Marine Corps and Randy picked him up in Huntington Beach. Loggins also had tattoos. The defense would quickly attempt to discredit the prosecution series by having Loggins' mom testify that her son had a drinking problem and a friend who also testified that Loggins was a drug user. Now, the defense also called a professor of pharmacy to the stand who testified that the levels of antihistamine in Loggins' blood work could not have been correct. He testified that in order to reach the levels documented, Loggins would have had to take 351 tablets and at least drink a gallon of water. As for victim Donald Crystal, the prosecution would suggest that he was the codename Marine Drunk Overnight Shorts, that entry on the list. Now, Crystal was a Marine who had been or gotten drunk, and when he was found, he was only wearing boxer shorts. The defense's comeback to this was to present information that Crystal was not only known to have problems with alcohol, but he also had problems with his sinuses that required antihistamines. They also said that the military police at Tustin had other information that there may be another possible suspect. However, they never presented what that information was. When discussing the case of Roland Young, the prosecution claimed he was listed as, quote, jail out since he had just been released from jail before he was murdered. Remember, this guy had just been released from jail at about 8 p.m. His body was discovered at 3 a.m. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are. 
because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. The defense countered any information the prosecution presented by attempting to attack the victim. They presented evidence that Young was known to take any drug that was offered and accessible. It was presented that after he was released from jail, his first order of business was to call a friend for a ride and then tell them he was in trouble with his supplier because he had used drugs he couldn't pay for. The defense instead argued that Randy Kraft had actually bailed his friend out of jail that April of 78, and that was what he was referring to on the entry on his list. However, Randy's friend testified that Randy never referred to him as Jailout or any other nickname. With regards to Mark Hall, the prosecution presented the fingerprint that had been found on the glass near the body of Mark Hall. Remember earlier, I had told you that the police had misplaced the fingerprint. Well, while the original lifted print had vanished or disappeared, a forensic specialist was able to use a new technique and once again was able to obtain the print, and it was a match to the right thumbprint of Randy Kraft. Now, Mark Hall was presented as the New Year's Eve entry on Randy Kraft's list. However, the defense would present members of Randy Kraft's family as his alibi for New Year's Eve. They would testify that Randy had attended a New Year's Eve party at his sister's house in Westminster. They testified that he was at the party until about 12.30 a.m. and they saw him again at their parents' house around 7 or 8 a.m. wearing the same clothing. Well, an investigator had already taken it upon himself to figure out if the murder of Mark Hall could have happened in that amount of time, in that time span. So this investigator drove from Randy Kraft's sister's house to San Juan Capistrano where Hall's body was found and then drove back to Randy Kraft's parents' house. This investigator determined that the driving portion would have taken about two and a half hours, leaving plenty of time for the other activities that Randy Kraft would have done. Neighbors would testify that Kraft was a wonderful neighbor. Now, this is not uncommon for most of the serial killers that we cover, right? In the case of Joseph Fancher, remember, Fancher was his first victim who survived. Well, Fancher actually testified that despite having asked the police for things in exchange for information and assistance, he hadn't actually received anything in exchange for telling them what happened. Fancher had been in police custody and on parole during the investigation, and he had asked the police for money, a vehicle and a loan, but he received none of these things so he had not been paid for his testimony. Joseph Fancher's mother testified for the defense that Fancher was a pathological liar and that she had previously had to tell that to people at his school. Now, the prosecution also presented all the things found in Randy Kraft's possession that belonged to the victims. Michael Cluck's shaving kit with his name on it was found under clothes in a drawer in Randy Kraft's house. And his roller skates, remember, he was eager to test them out. Well, they were also found in the house. Christopher Schoenburn's Mighty Mac jacket was found in Randy Kraft's garage, and his keychain and bottle opener were in the pocket of a coat there. Christopher's boots and belt were also found in Randy Kraft's house. Anthony Silviera's tennis shoes and Brian Witcher's jacket were also found at the house. And Lance Tagg's blue tote and nunchucks were also found in Randy Kraft's house. The trial dragged on for 13 full months, 
and the jury deliberated for 11 days before returning their verdict. Guilty. While they did acquit on the charge of sodomizing Roger Duvall, Randy Kraft was convicted on all 16 counts of murder, one count of sodomy, and one count for the mutilation castration of Jeffrey Nelson. Jurors who were later interviewed stated that they almost immediately agreed to the guilty verdicts for Terry Gambrell and some of the other victims that Randy had taken photos of, stating, quote, he had pictures of those people in his house, so that was easy, end quote. Beyond that, they had to discuss the details more thoroughly. Before and after his sentencing, Randy Kraft continued to proclaim his innocence, saying, quote, I have not murdered anyone, and I believe a reasonable review of the record will show that, end quote. The penalty phase began on June 5th of 89, and that dragged on for another four months. But eventually, a sentence had been adjudged, the death penalty. During the course of the penalty phase, multiple jailers were called to testify to the fact that Randy Kraft was a, quote, model prisoner, end quote, in the six years that he'd been in custody. Former co-workers were called as character witnesses and they called Randy friendly, outgoing, and normal. They even went so far as to say that, quote, society would lose a very brilliant mind if Randy Kraft were to be executed. <laughs> what? A neuroscientist from the University of California, Irvine, Monty Buxbaum, testified that Randy Kraft had brain damage that might explain his sexual violence. Other than the falls that Randy had as a child that I mentioned in part one, this is the first time it has been mentioned that he has had any type of brain damage. There has never been any indication that Randy Kraft had ever been abused either. The defense also called a psychiatrist to testify that Randy's violence was, quote, something that he had no control over, end quote. Unsure why that's part of the defense other than to say that he can't help it, so he shouldn't be executed, but he never claimed insanity through any of his claims. Ministers who were opposed to the death penalty testified, but their testimony was later called, quote, silly by Judge McCartan. He also called their testimony, quote, so far afield, it's stupid, end quote. The prosecution called Joe Fancher, the 13-year-old assault victim that survived, I mentioned him earlier, his mom called him a pathological liar. Well, he described the assault that Randy Kraft inflicted on him. Finally, the prosecution went over the scorecard and told the jury sarcastically, quote, there's nothing wrong with him other than that he likes killing for sexual satisfaction, end quote. The judge, Superior Court Judge Donald A. McCartan, he upheld the death sentence on November 29th of 89. Then Judge McCartan called the acts that Randy was now convicted of, stating that they were, quote, beyond comprehension, end quote. He continued saying, quote, I can't imagine doing these things in scientific experiments on a dead body, much less to someone alive, end quote. Judge McCartan also said, quote, I sat there for a year and looked at craft. I didn't see any remorse feeling, or regret. It was like he was in another world, end quote. Along with the death sentences handed down for the murders of Scott Michael Hughes, Roland Gerald Young, Richard Allen Keith, Keith Arthur Klingbeil, Michael Joseph Indenberg, Donald Harold Chrysler, Robert Wyatt Loggins Jr., Eric Herbert Church, Jeffrey Allen Nelson, Roger James, Robert James Duvall Jr., and Terry Lee Gambrell. Randy Kraft was also given consecutive life sentences for each of the murders of Edward Daniel Moore, John Doe from Huntington Beach, Ronald Jean Weeb, Keith Davin Crotwell, and Mark Howard Hall. Randy also got three consecutive years for great bodily injury, four years for inflicting mayhem, and another three years for sodomy. In the end, the trial totaled. $10 million, and the appeals process has been going on ever since. His trial cost would only be topped by Charles Ning in 99, whose trial cost over $20 million. 
And don't worry, I plan on covering that case in the future. In a death penalty sentence, appeals are instantly triggered. Randy would use these appeals to claim that his trial had numerous legal errors. However, he didn't have an attorney or the money to pay a new attorney. So he was forced to wait over two years to be given an attorney by the state and only got one because he filed the lawsuit. The trial transcripts in and of themselves totaled 38,000 pages. So that was 38,000 pages that a brand new attorney would need to review delaying the process further. One source said that this, quote, probably amounts to several times the complete literary output of novelist John Grisham, end quote. (laughs) Then Randy's appeal would total another 717 pages. The legal work required to file these appeals would total $345,000. Randy was rarely happy with the counselors that he was provided with and he tried to get them changed out as often as possible. During his original appeal of his death sentence, Randy claimed that the gas chamber that was still in use in California at the time, well, he claimed that it violated his First Amendment rights of religious freedom by forcing him to, quote, actively participate in his own killing, end quote. Randy also claimed that the searches and seizures for his car and home were all done illegally and not supported by probable cause. He claimed that things were taken from his house that were not part of the search warrants and that almost everything found in those searches should be thrown out. Of course, this motion was denied. He also claimed that the original arrest was illegal as well. When he was seen weaving by police, they turned on their lights and attempted to pull Randy over. Now, Randy, seeing the police behind him, he says he straightened up his driving and he slowed his speed down to 30 miles per hour. Remember, he didn't pull over right away and he drove another fourth of a mile before finally coming to a stop. Well, Randy would claim that the fact that he straightened up his driving when the police turned on their lights, that showed that he wasn't drunk, but instead he was just distracted, which I think is kind of a funny argument. Once stopped and out of his car, one of the officers had him perform a field sobriety test, which he promptly failed. He was arrested and upon his arrest, the officers attempted to awaken Randy's passenger. In that attempt, the officer had to go through the unlocked driver's side door. And as he entered the car, he saw a bottle of Ativan between the driver's seat and the door. And he also found a folding buck knife in the driver's seat. It was just sitting there. Neither were hidden at all. And he put both on the roof of the car. The police officer did. Now, they quickly found that the passenger had no pulse and wasn't breathing. Upon his arrest and the discovery of a dead body with him, the police were able to obtain quite quickly warrants to search his home and his car. And it was also noticed by an investigator that they had many other dead bodies with the same physical features and ligatures, making it probable that they could all be connected. Now, these details gave them probable cause to search and once again, Randy's motion was denied. Kraft then claimed that the homicides should have all been severed and tried in 16 separate trials. His team presented a study from a professor of psychology whose research has found that having multiple charges at one time made it much more likely that a jury would convict. This motion was also denied for many, many reasons. It was presented that all of the victims shared physical attributes as well as almost all having hitchhiked, been drugged with similar medication, sodomized, had mutilated genitals and ligature marks and had been strangled. It was ruled that most of the evidence in the different cases would be, quote, cross admissible, end quote. And Kraft's lawsuits would reach outside of the court system. In 93, Randy filed a lawsuit against an author by the name of Dennis McDowell. McDowell wrote the book Angel of Darkness that was released in 91, and it was all about Kraft's spree. He called it the most heinous murder spree of the century. Kraft filed a $60 million libel lawsuit against McDowell and his publishing company, claiming that 
the book, quote, unfairly portrayed him as a sick, twisted man and, quote, ruined his prospects for future employment, end quote. <laughs> what, 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 what in the world? Hey, Randy, you know who ruined your prospects of future employment? You did, buddy. You did that all by yourself. During this time, Randy's attorney complained to the judge that Randy was an extremely difficult client. He supported this claim, saying that Randy wanted to be his own attorney and filed his own motions that the actual attorney referred to as, quote, voluminous. The libel suit was, of course, dismissed by the California Supreme Court in June of 94. But McDougall and the publishers, they were pissed and they filed a countersuit in September to have Kraft repay the almost $50,000 in legal fees that they acquired trying to defend themselves in a frivolous lawsuit. McDougall also wanted to have the computer that Randy had used to file the suit. He wanted that computer seized. McDowell went on to say, quote, I'm not pursuing this because I think Randy will have a cache of gold doubloons under his mattress. What concerns me about all this is that a felon and one who has been convicted of the worst crimes imaginable can sue anybody they want with impunity on a regular basis. They clog the court systems with phony baloney suits and the state allows them to do it without charging them a dime to file, end quote. Then, in continuing his appeal of his original court, Randy Kraft alleged that by allowing the prosecution to use the, quote, death list and present it as a scorecard, the judge prejudiced the jury against him. Surprisingly, Randy Kraft maintained that the list was just a list of lovers he had that, for all he knew, were still alive and well. The appeal was made to the Supreme Court, but they disagreed with Randy Kraft. They ruled that the list of encrypted names or code names was relevant to the case and was appropriate to be allowed in as evidence. And it wouldn't be until after his trial and conviction that another John Doe was identified. A John Doe from Huntington Beach was identified as an 18-year-old drifter named Kevin Clark Bailey who had been found back in March of 85. In May of 2000, the California Supreme Court finally heard the appeal. But on August 11, 2000, Randy Kraft's death sentence was unanimously upheld by the California Supreme Court. They agreed that he should die for his crimes. In 2001, a Canadian website that opposes the death penalty they posted a message that was reportedly from Randy Kraft, but it was written in the third person. Quote, Randy was convicted on hysteria, innuendo, and common prejudice against gay persons such as himself. There never was any real evidence against him. There is none today. Instead, the prosecutor lied to make up for no evidence and hid evidence helpful to Randy. The police also hid evidence at critical times and the trial judge looked the other way, a Marine Corps veteran prejudiced against gay persons, end quote. Randy maintained there was no evidence against him. No evidence. Okay, let's talk about it. No evidence other than 47 pictures under the driver's side floor mat with victims propped up on a floral couch in Randy Kraft's Long Beach home. In the pictures, the couch and the wall behind it are covered in blood. There's no evidence, though. There's no evidence other than the shaving kit with the name of one of the murdered men from Oregon's name on it. Oh, OK. And no evidence other than Randy Kraft's fingerprint on a glass found near one of the bodies. Yeah. OK, Randy. However, despite all of the back and forth, the death penalty still stood. But no executions have taken place in California since 2006. And I've talked about this before in one of my other episodes. In 2019, California Governor Gavin Newsom, he signed an executive order halting the death penalty. This allowed for over 700 California death row inmates to have their lives continue rolling along. Newsom was quoted saying, quote, the intentional killing of another person is wrong. 
and as governor, I will not oversee the execution of any individual. Our death penalty system has been, by all measures, a failure, end quote. He went on to say, quote, I do not believe that a civilized society can claim to be a leader in the world as long as its governor continues to sanction the premeditation and discriminatory execution of its people, end quote. This executive order is in effect throughout Newsom's time as governor. So the next governor could, in theory, revoke this, but it's currently unknown if or when Randy Kraft's death sentence will be carried out, if ever. In 2009, there was a ruling by a federal judge that tossed out most of the appeals that Randy Kraft and his lawyer filed. They were dismissed as, quote, meritless. Kraft also fired his attorney at the time, claiming the state was, quote, manipulating the attorney in a puppet-like fashion, end quote. Randy Kraft is in the company of numerous other notorious serial killers, including the Grim Sleeper, the dating game killer, Scott Peterson, and the Golden State Killer. The last known information on Randy Kraft noted that he was in San Quentin and enjoyed playing bridge with his friends, Lawrence Bittaker, Douglas Clark, the Sunset Strip Slayer, and William Bonin until Bonin's execution on February 23rd of 96. The jury foreman, James Little, who oversaw Randy Kraft's jury, he was quoted as saying of Randy, quote, he's lived longer in prison than the whole lives of most of the kids he killed. I mean, come on now. Little had been unable to work for the entirety of the trial and he got so far into debt that he had to quit college where he was working towards becoming a teacher. He had to take a job as a construction worker. Little's participation in the trial would also be a point of contention for future appeals. In a strange coincidence, Little had been invited to the same party that Terry Gambrell was trying to get to when he was hitchhiking. In fact, that housewarming party was being thrown by the man that would become Little's brother-in-law. However, Little didn't remember if he went to the party at all, but he didn't know Terry Gambrell because Terry Gambrell never made it, and he never discussed the case with any of his relatives. I guess the issue there was whether Randy was prejudiced when Little sat on the jury. This issue was introduced into the federal docket in August of 2011, but I'm assuming it was denied. Another jury, Pat Markintel Springer, said, quote, I think they should execute him. He should have been executed a long time ago. It was so obvious being caught with a dead Marine in your car is pretty much a giveaway, end quote. Randy Kraft has only ever granted one interview to an L.A. Times reporter. Jerry Hicks interviewed Randy Kraft for 30 minutes in November of 83. That wasn't too long after his arrest. However, Randy later said that Hicks had misquoted him and claimed that Hicks accused him of being gay. He also continued to assert that the list was just that of a friend's name. It wasn't a so-called scorecard. A priest and the chaplain on death row, George Williams, he described the cells and the general living quarters of the inmates. He said that they were dark, cramped and windowless in the cells with heavy metal mess and a barred door. He said that each cell has a stainless steel toilet slash sink and a small TV and that there was incessant background noise. Williams described the smell as locker room mixed with a cafeteria mixed with an outhouse. Yuck. Randy gets regular exercise and he listens to music on CDs. He also signed up for a website that matches up inmates to pen pals. One source quoted his profile as saying, quote, I'm not an old fogey. I like to read all sorts of things and listen to most kinds of music. I enjoy and am pretty good at crossword puzzles and Sudoku. And I like to write. I'm friendly, low key and sincere, end quote. Randy Kraft's scorecard contained a lot of code names that have never been identified. And this is sad. It's also sad that there are so many John Doe's that remain unidentified until this day. This serial killer case hits so close to home, especially for this podcast, because not only was Randy an Air Force veteran, 
But six of the 16 victims for which he was convicted, they were all active duty Marines. This concludes this mini series on serial killer Randy Kraft. To be honest, had I known it was going to be as gruesome as it was, I may have skipped him altogether. But alas, here we are. Thanks again to Sloan for researching and writing this three-part series. I don't normally do three-parters, but this one required the time and attention because of the amount of victims in Randy's past. If you're a fan of the show, please take a moment to leave five stars on Apple Podcasts. It really does help people find the show. It's social proof that people in the universe are actually listening. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my boot camp and higher fan club members. Executive producers are Falcon 13, Nicole, Alicia, and Tina S., owner of Stitch 6 to 6 Embroidery. The music was created by Tie Ups. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Podcast.